Richard, thank you for your most welcome. It's my honor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you can uh, give a bit of your biography, your spiritual biography. Um, I know some of it, but you've been practicing for a long time, so. Uh, <clears throat> I'll make this brief because I tend to be long winded on. Uh, I had a natural interest in uh, spirituality since I was probably 12 or 13. My father's best friend, Mike Cohen, his business partner, said that to my father one day while I was listening that ritual would be either a great success or a complete failure. By failure, he meant he would probably go into the spiritual realm rather than business. Uh, so that's, since I was about 13, I've been doing some kind of practice or other. Uh, actually, as a four square assembly of God, holy roller Christian, till I was about 17. And I left that for Hinduism. <coughs> then when I was about 18, and surfing on the North Shore of Oahu, where some of the best surfers in the world and the best surf in the world, I got interested in Buddhist practice quite deeply with my friends, my surf friends. Since there's not always surf, surfers need something to do when there's no surf. So I, we would all go out into the jungles of Hawaii and spend the day meditating. We didn't know much about what we were doing, <coughs> but we would nevertheless meditate five, six hours together and then go back to the beach where we lived. We lived on the beaches and we had houses on the beach at that time. Uh, my practice started taking off while I was surfing, and one day I realized that surfing had to go if I was going to get really serious. And I walked to the beach one day, sold my board for $100, and that was the end of my surfing career. I worked on the first hotel on the Big Island of Hawaii, and got $2,000, went to India and Nepal, and practiced there with lived the first year in the Tibetan monastery on the Everest trek, Mount Everest trek, and then spent another year in India wandering around receiving blessings and teachings from many different uh, Tibetan lamas <clears throat> and actually four enlightened women, yoginis, that were incredible. And I still see some of them today. Uh, after two years, I... Uh, didn't have a visa all that time and I went back to California and I knew I would find a teacher I did within one week and I found Master Shuenwa took full bhikkhu ordination <clears throat> and 19, late 1960s that was 1971 okay. I was back in the United States and took bhikkhu ordination with the Master Shuenwa I was with him for 10 years, and after 10 years, I left the monastery. I was still a bhikshu. I spent two years meditating in Golden Gate, or probably a year and a half, or a year, in Golden Gate Park and different places in the city before going to back to Nepal, where I continued in Nepal for 10 years. Uh, during that time, I disrobed and married a Nepalese girl, had three children with her, and we spent a wonderful time raising our children together. And then I went out on my own again, which I am now for the last 20 or so years. So about half, a good part of my life, probably 15 or 20 years was in the Nepal and India, practicing and studying Buddhism. The other time was in America, and that's it. That's very <coughs> concise. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you're 78 now. I'm 78. 78. So you've been practicing for over 50 years. and uh, I was practicing since I was around, a serious practice since I was about 20. That By a serious, I mean eight hours a day. I spent two years before going to India and Nepal, meditating in jungles in Hawaii all day. Had no money, no house, no food, no problems. I ate whatever I could get off the land and what fishermen would give me. And in fact, I lived in a fishing camp helping to mend nets for a little while on the Makaha side of uh, a 
Oahu. You have a really unique perspective in that most people, you know, have practiced in a lay form or have practiced in a, a monastic form, and many people aren't really satisfied with, say, either one of those, especially people who maybe aren't, don't have complete affinities with a specific monastic form, and then they're kind of left, can be left adrift and say, how do I practice really seriously in a, in a lay form? And uh, I'm curious if you could speak to that, maybe just explain, explain your robes and how you practice and maybe where you're living now, so a bit yeah. of context, so I know, but... I, I just yeah. started wearing these robes about a... About, this is, a, by the way, not a monk robe. I would never do that. I even have a shawl that I wear sometimes that I'm very careful to cover both shoulders so people don't think I'm a monk. Mm. Because if you're impersonating a monk, it's a very, very big offense. And I would never do that. Uh, but uh, I started wearing this because I started seeing about, not very long ago, probably a, less than a year ago, I saw I was getting attached to clothes. My daughter, who lives in Hawaii, would send me these really beautiful Hawaiian shirts, you know, like $100 and $200 shirts that were really phenomenal. And I saw, wow, those are pretty nice, you know, and I started wearing them around here at the monastery. And then I got a little, I saw I was getting a little attached to clothes, and I thought, well, why do you get a drab uh, layperson's robe? So I got a drab layperson's robe, I put it on. And then usually I ride my bicycle to town, but then a few weeks ago, I decided, well, I'll walk into town. It's For me, it's, I'm slow. It's about a two-hour walk to Costco and back for me. But then I, I put on my robes. I said, well, I don't have, since I'm not riding my bicycle, I can wear my robes. Well, as soon as I got out on the, road, on the road with my robes on, I found I got picked up right away by people I knew that, you know, from the community here, that they <laughs> identify with the robe. So since then, I've been, you know, like if I'm lazy, I don't want to ride my bicycle, I just get out on the road and I don't even have to hitchhike because the road doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> right. So that, that's a, the short answer. But um, I will say one thing about it. And, uh, what I said at the beginning is really true. And in fact, I read a story of a Fortune 500 CEO that actually about 15 or 20 years ago, she said the same thing. She was extremely wealthy and she had a wardrobe that was incredible. And she saw the same thing. And she's, she uh, decided that she's gonna find an outfit. And she went into town and she made, got an outfit that looks you know, conservative and looks you know, okay. And she bought three of them. And she started showing up and working the exact same thing every day. And she says she loves it. You know, she's really happy about it. People comment, are you wearing the same thing all the time? She said, they don't care. You know? mm -hmm. And so there's something to say about, you know, well, it says two things. One thing is that the Dharma is everywhere. Here's a woman that's practicing non-attachment uh, to things uh, that probably never connected it with Dharma. And the second thing is that it's convenient where you, you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's clothing. And another material requisite is lodging. So people can't tell by the wall, but actually we are at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Yeah. And, uh, could you talk about how your living situation? So you lived here as a monk, and then you've been back here now for maybe four I've been or back five here years, uh, six years. Okay. And uh, well, it'll be six years this September. And uh, since I left in 1982, I've been back occasionally. Uh, during my Nepal, in my life in Nepal and India, I would come, whenever I came to the United States every couple of years, I would uh, visit here for a couple of weeks or so. Uh, I actually was the first one living here officially and sent by the master specifically to live here to run out the ghost at Tathagata Monastery, which is now the monk's headquarters. So I spent about six months here uh, almost by myself. There was Hong Lai was here and a couple of people in the firehouse to help maintain the grounds. But there was a handful, literally, of us here in the very, very beginning before anybody moved up. 1977, uh, maybe? 76? I don't recall the date, like but it's probably yeah. earlier than that, probably 75 or mm. 6. Yeah. Well, and so running out the ghost, so people might not know this, but um, I mean, 
to target a monastery used to be? To target a monastery was for the criminally insane. Uh, <laughs> when it was a, a mental health institution. Uh, yeah. The ward. city of 10,000 Buddhas was owned by the state of California. The state of California at the time had two mental institutions. Uh, one was Camarillo and one was uh, the Mendoza Mendocino State Mental Hospital, which is this place where we're at now. And at some point, the state couldn't afford to uh, run two mental institutions. It ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So they sold this place, this, these grounds, to a vineyardier, Beckstoffer. Beckstoffer called in the number one uh, wreckers in the United States to destroy this place so he could plant grapes. Uh, Chicago Wrecking came out here and they checked the, all the buildings and they said it's basically cannot be blown up or destroyed unless you drop an atomic bomb on it or something because it was all built with a kind of a mix of cement and extra strong rebar that it was unfeasible to blow it up. It could be done, but you know it would be extraordinarily expensive. So Beckstoffer put it back on the market. We bought it from Beckstoffer. Uh, we signed the papers. Actually, I was there with one of four people with Scherfer when we signed the papers with Beckstoffer, his attorney, and Scherfer. And uh, I don't recall the date, but I have the photograph. And I, I'll send it to you. I'll send that photograph sure. to uh, on, on Kobe Low, and maybe we can include it in the video, the signing of, of this place. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yep. So what made you decide to come back? I mean, your children are all older. They're all adults now. So. Uh, uh, our, uh, the idea of coming back, you know, really never occurred to me because it's uh, never re occurred to me to become a monk. I know some people agonize over becoming a monk. Uh, and agonize over leaving, but I did both pretty much without thinking about it any, at all. For me, it was very natural. I had raised my children with my wife, and I bought her a home in Cathedral City, and I had already earned a lot of money trading stocks and lost a lot of money, and I, I decided that uh, since I never gave up my practice during for an instance, since I uh, left City of 10,000 Buddhas as a bhikshu, uh, it would be very natural just to, you know, live in a monkish environment once again. So that's why I'm here. And uh, I would say that in passing that if you keep your practice up, and I have a very close friend who's the most skilled meditator I know, and a, a disciple of the master also, who left here after seven years and became in a, went to Harvard, graduated from Harvard Law School, and became a, an attorney. He also uh, continued his practice that he had as a monk throughout his life. And he's one or two years older than I am. His name is Hung Sho, he, Fred Clare, he's in New York. And we still talk about practice regularly because uh, some of the nuances of, of practice we both uh, uh, discuss and try to enlarge our understanding when we talk to each other. I think just in a moment I'd like to go more into the practice side of things, but just um, to round this out, because I think a lot of people don't, yeah, are, are so curious about different forms, ways to live a spiritual life. And in your way of conceiving, I mean, you're 78 now, but you're very healthy and as far as I can tell. And um, do you have thoughts for the future? Do you think you'll just stay here ongoing or? Uh, thoughts of the future. When you get 78, you don't have too many thoughts of the future. <laughs> okay. My friend jokes he doesn't buy a, uh, extended warranties anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he's four years older than mine. And I suggested the other day that since he's buying a computer, he should get an extended warranty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, as far as thoughts of the future, I've always lived in the moment. Well, it's a pretty good good setup here. I mean, you're you're here. You contribute to the the whole city. You do groundwork. You 
contribute by your own meditation and um, so it doesn't seem like it seems like it's it's working out um, you know if your practice is you know this is an excellent place to practice you know monasteries are phenomenal I'm no longer a monk but I, I like being in a monastery it, if you're doing a lot of practice you know it's you kind of get into the vibe of being in a monastery and supportive um, by everybody else. The fact that, you know, thoughts have wings. Everybody here in this monastery is here because they want to uh, understand the nature of their own mind better. They want to uh, uh, end ignorance. And so that's the kind of motive everybody has for being in a way place, regardless of where it is. Uh, the rules here happen to be very uh, strict regarding men and women. The women are on one side, men on the other side of the property. It's a 440 immediate acres and many acres beyond that, but uh, it has a kind of a strict, no-nonsense uh, atmosphere about it. You know, of course, no smoking, drinking, or anything like that on the grounds, and no mixing, you know, no casual talks with, uh, 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 you know, you know, picnics with members of the opposite sex or something like that. So it's just a, an environment that supports a meditative lifestyle. And I highly recommend it for anybody that hasn't practiced a lot to volunteer in a monastery, a good monastery, where they have rules of conduct and so forth. It's just helpful. It's not necessary, necessarily, mm. especially if you have a strong practice. Mm. Yeah, that's a great recollection. I think a lot of people might not be aware that there are monasteries that have lay living environments in them, even Theravada monasteries. I know Chuang Yin Monastery has a small section for, well, I mean, that's a Mahayana Buddhist monastery, but monasteries in Thailand, I know some that have, um, yeah, lay sections to them and like long-term supporters or just people who are just want exactly what you're talking about of a, a way place. This is a... Um, a translation of um, yeah, like a, a monastery, which Theravada people might not be familiar with, but it's a great phrase because it's exactly what you're describing. It's even though different people have different inclinations and capacities to practice, and practice means different things to different people. The sincerity, everyone here is quite sincere, and it really is a, a way place. Um, yeah, that's true. And also has facilities that are phenomenal, mm. such as an incredible library mm. uh, of Buddhist texts and, and other books, but uh, an amazing library in several languages, Sanskrit, Pali, and uh, European languages as well. And it's actually 100 yards from where I sleep every night. So like, it's very convenient living in a in a way place as far as practical things. And then there's, of course, ceremonies, uh, Dharma lectures, all of which I really like. For, for me, I, I generally like to attend one ceremony at least a day, an hour and a half. I used to ta take two or three a day. I find them, uh, people have different motivations for attending ceremonies. I like to uh, go sometimes to relax because uh, meditation, for me, it's sometimes pretty strenuous, you know, mm -hmm. use breath regulation and, you know, it's, it can get pretty hard. And so I kind of like to be around the people and feel part of the community instead of isolating myself all the time. I invite Coven over here for lunch once right. a week. Great at, cook. At my, great cook. At my place for kitchery, which is, you know, just an Indian pot, yogi food. It's, you know, you put everything in a pot that you have and you cook it and hope it Hope for the best. <laughs> it's always it's always worked. I haven't uh, <laughs> I haven't expired yet. So, uh, but on that note, I mean, it does tie in like the issue of food, and you mentioned like separation of genders. Both of these are issues around morality, or like precepts. And I mean, you could. I'd love to hear more about your diet. I, I know a little bit about it, or like your your eating routine, but also then just your precepts. What precepts you keep, or what your principles are. Uh, well. Basically, you know, when, when, uh, when we meditate, we don't want unnecessary distractions, basically, you know. Mm -hmm. If they're not there, you won't have to put them out of your mind. So there's not many distractions here. Mm -hmm. And you feel like uh, you're contributing, you know, volunteers come here from all over the world. They, 
they stay in the lay area and they have a small room pretty much the size of this which is probably 10 feet by 10 feet but you have all your food provided you have a room provided you know that you don't really need and there's you know soap and all of this is distributed and you know practical needs of life are pretty much there uh, so it get it takes away a lot from if you want to really practice you can do it without you know having practical concern also it works out for the monastery because after all uh, some people work very hard uh, on the grounds uh, anywhere between four and eight hours a day there's 400 acres here so that uh, those volunteers that work on the ground they're accumulating a heck of a lot of great karma you know uh, and that karma build is foundation building so you can plug right into meditation you can sit for an hour and accomplish a lot if you're contributing you know like the volunteers here do so it's foundation building it help benefits the monastery it's not just the, the volunteers ben benefiting from the monastery it goes both ways and that's very very important for you know individual self-esteem for one thing and then practical things there's 400 acres here of buildings and stuff that have to be maintained it's a lot of you know a lot for people to do and it's and uh, so the it's you know, it, it works out beneficial for both ways. Mm. I mean, one thing in addition to um, yeah, the work that everyone living at a wake place has to do, you know, it's a reciprocal relationship. You're both receiving basically the inheritance of the Buddha. You know, we're, we're practicing and then we're given a place to practice. And um, in addition to giving back, um, you mentioned just your own personal practice and but you've also got to eat, and I mean, I'll just do the reveal that I mean, you only you're 78 years old, but you still just eat just one meal a day. Yeah, I I eat out of a quart and a half bowl. It's a corning bowl, so there's a little measure on the bottom of it. it tells me how much I, I noticed the other day. I'm eating a quart and a half. I used to eat a lot, lot more than that. Uh, sometimes three times. Uh, the master. When he was alive, he commented, commented on my food more than once. Uh, I'll tell you a funny incident and uh, leave it at that. But one time I had like a pot like this big, literally full of food. It's a big pot. In, in, Go in Gold <laughs> Mountain in the, in the Buddha Hall. And he walked, he was walking down the line of all the monks in, uh, in the Buddha Hall, in the dining hall. And he, he saw my bowl of food and he stopped and he looked at me and then he looked at the bowl of food and then I kind of apologetically said, and it's true, I said, my father says I have a stomach without a memory. <laughs> and then the master didn't say anything. He turned and he walked away. <laughs> and then typical Chan master style, he walked back and he looked at me and then he said, well, why do you remember to eat? <laughs> <laughs> so he turned the phrase completely around, you know, <laughs> and uh, of course there's no answer. Often there wasn't an answer for things that Sherpu said. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as food goes, uh, as a layperson, uh, I've gone on a lot of diets, which I won't go into. But, uh, you know, mono diets and stuff. Even before I became a monk, I'd done extended fasts and mono diets and you name it. But uh, as a lay person, I, after leaving here, I was still eating once a day for about 10 or 15, eh, probably 15 years. Uh, and then I went back to eating three times a day for another 15 years. And then... I was at a fellow disciple, Hung Chong's uh, monastery in Los Angeles, uh, who's one of the master's most gifted disciples. He's still a monk to this day. That's the one who inherited stillness flowing, by the way. Oh, yeah? And okay. he's so happy about it. Oh, okay. And so, uh, uh, we were all eating together, and 
he had about 20 people. Often people go over to his house, uh, disciples would go there. And I was sitting next to him and he was eating his, his food, his daily meal, and he was eating once a day. And, but none of his disciples were. But that was about eight or 10 years ago and I decided right there while I was eating with him that I'd eat once a day again. So I'm not committed to it, but I've been eating once a day now for probably about 10 years. It's just really healthy. Uh, the masters also said it's super healthy and yogis also will say that, you know, there's less cleaning up, there's less preparation, there's less time eating. All of that can go to practice. And when you eat once a day, you really learn a lot about diet. You, you learn it, how your body functions, what it needs. You know that it's not the same as everybody else. I myself, I eat fish once a week. I've been a vegetarian most of my life. But uh, I found that if I eat fish once a week, it works for me. So I'm not uh, uh, going to you know, advocate any particular uh, diet. I think it's disingenuous. It misses the whole point. Not to mention the fact that uh, if you're actually living in a situation like, for example, Tibetans, you cannot be a vegetarian unless you leave the country. The mean ad altitude of Tibet is 17,500 feet. You're not going to grow any vegetable or fruit there. And so Tibetans were pretty much forced to, you know, eat meat. You know, it's as simple as that to live. But um, on the side of the vegetarians, I'll say one of the greatest masters of all time in the Tibetan tradition, uh, Chukka Rinpoche, who passed away a few years back, five or six years back, at 110, he launched a drive for becoming vegetarian in all uh, Tibetan monasteries. He's the one that turned Bodh Gaya into a vegetarian, all no meat place, way place, and Sarnoff too, and you cannot find meat in that place. I think that's great, but I also think that uh, there's something to be said about when f food is offered to you with a good heart, you know, like when I was living in Nepal, the Nepalese would prepare food for me when I was a vegetarian, and I could not say, oh, I'm not going to eat it because I'm a vegetarian. I've seen people do that, friends of mine do that, and I think it's really wrong, you know, not to accept food that's offered in good faith, especially if uh, they are not aware of you being a vegetarian and so forth. So, you know, the, there's nothing in the scripture that's anywhere that says that one has to be a, a vegetarian. You, you, it's more important not to get angry. Richard, let's shift over into just meditation practice. I'd love to hear both like a, a history of your, your practice. I mean, you were here in this tradition, City of Counts of 10,000 Buddhas, Chinese, Mahayana, and then you moved to Nepal and were practicing Tibetan Buddhism. And I'd just love to hear how that journey has been for you. Like what, what was your practice when you were here? What was it when you were in Nepal? What is it now? How has that changed? How is it the same? Well, Kovilo has asked me what my practice was when I was here, but my practice actually began uh, five or six years before I got here. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have conditions from past lives that we plug into, and sometimes practice comes very naturally for people. For myself, I stumbled around in Christianity, but in a very serious way. Uh, I... Uh, I actually was my training partner at Muscle Beach Weightlifting Club when I was not even out of high school was Ron Letus, who was a famous bodybuilder, but he was also a preacher at the Pentecostal church. And so I spoken in tongues and got all into the Christianity thing in a big way. And then uh, studied with uh, some Hindu teachers, not studied with them, but studied Hinduism very deeply enough to really get interested in Buddhism too because they grew out of each other and continue to do so. And by the time I got here at this monastery, I had the good fortune of re receiving excellent instruction every night for a whole year from Sangi Tenzin Lama. And we would talk, and he's the Nyingmapa Lama, 
And I lived in his monastery for one year in the Himalayas. And uh, we discussed Dharma very deeply. So I learned a lot from him. He's actually my first teacher. And he's the one who uh, sent me bundled up with some offerings of butter and a kata to meet Tushik Rinpoche, which was about a five hour walk from his monastery. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was the head of the Nyingmapa lineage, and he was until he died. And that was in 1970 um, uh, uh, or so, 69, that I visited him. And that, unbeknownst to me at the time, was going to be a, friend, a friendship and a discipleship that would last throughout my life, uh, and visit with frequent visits. and and a big influence on me. Mm. So I, after that, I spent a year in India uh, receiving other teachings uh, from Hindu master, Sakya Sai Baba, and living in Calcutta also for six months, visiting temples almost every day. So when I came here, I had a very diverse background. I just did what I was doing all along. In fact, <clears throat> Uh, I didn't know it at the time. I thought nobody liked me at Gold Mountain when I first stayed there because I just walked in the door and uh, I stayed. You know, I, I asked if I could stay and they said yes and I just started meditating. I didn't talk to anybody and the master wasn't around for six, he was on tour. So for me it was um, just a continuation of what I was doing all along. And like I said, I was bumping around, kind of like with, you know, not really knowing what I was doing a big part of the time. And one of the great things about studying with like a great master like Sherpa is, you know, That's you master can... Wa. What? That's Master Wa. Master, like master Wa, Master Shuen Wa, we call him Sherpa, which means revered father. But the great thing is like, <clears throat> like for me, from my own perspective and from what other people have said about me, that I have great faith that I don't know what I'm doing at the time. <laughs> so I heard a, quite a renowned master say that, told me that. But um, the point is that, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. You know, some people are so clever, sure, uh, masters, Chuan Ma, he said that some people are so clever that they outsmart themselves and it's try and figure ways to practice less. You know, I mean, there's some people might be strong on faith but weak on wisdom and they just practice a whole lot and they're like a bear going through the woods. You know, they just put their head down and they go and they don't worry about the sappers, whatever is in the way, they just go. And so I was kind of like that. And the good thing about being in a monastery and under a great teacher is that if you're like that, if you happen to be like that, have a strong drive to practice but you don't know what you're doing, they get into your mind stream somehow and they kind of like are a rudder on your ship and they help you to get the correct view because the, in practice, it's motivation is everything. I mean, some people say, oh, I meditated eight hours today or 10 hours, like I used to say, but I tell you, if you, if you meditate well for a half hour, you can do more than you can for eight hours. So it's skill, a lot of it is skill, doing it right. So when you're with a master, it can make all the difference in the world. That's so, so important. If you're practicing without a teacher's guidance, it's not gonna work, you know, it just won't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can, if you're in a way place, it will work because the blessings are there, but on your own, it's almost impossible. To give like a little bit more context for that, like when you were practicing either with Sai Baba or Sochin Rinpoche before you ordained and then with Sherpu, what was the object or was that even secondary? Were you training in a type of awareness where the object wasn't even so important? Uh, well, what were the specifics of the Yeah, practice? believe it or not, uh, I didn't know how to meditate at all at the beginning, so I just took a Psalm of David. Uh, one of the Psalms from the Bible, which is a few lines. And I meditated on that for a whole year in Hawaii, all day, reciting it like a mantra. And uh, I just uh, used that. 
And then one day in India, where I lived in a cave in the South Indian desert for a year, and I was still reciting that. And then that psalm was, Be still and know I am God. It's a very famous psalm. And uh, I just took that. I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out that uh, that particular psalm was quite well known in India. When I got off my plane in Calcutta, there were billboards everywhere with that psalm on it. I couldn't, you know, it was quite a remarkable confirmation in my heart that, oh, being in India is going to go well. And it did. So when I was in the cave in South India about Sachi Sai Baba's ashram, I was still reciting that psalm. And then one day I thought, well, why not recite it between each breath? And that led to a whole practice of learning how to practice pranayama breath mastery. And so to this day, that was 1970 that that happened, that I started integrating it into the breath. Uh, I use for, I always practice at least an hour of dedicated breath mastery every day. And then all, I never practice ever a mantra without integrating it into the breath, integrating the breath into it. So the breath, the prana is extremely important in practice. And um, I learned a lot of different mantras since then, and I have my own mantras I use, uh, Sanskrit and Tibetan and uh, Chinese, but at least half of the practice of any mantra should be have to do with the breath. So you gotta, you know, if you know how to use your breath, it's really a short cake, uh, shortcut, short cake to <laughs> cheesecake. <laughs> Yeah, on that on that point, I've asked you, I've asked you before about this, but um, I mean, for many people, I mean, for myself, when I've been in places where we've been meditating eight plus hours a day, it really does become, it actually becomes unpleasant for me, um, or, or it has in the past. And when I've asked you about that, I mean, you're, you're keeping track of the time, and you've actually just talked about how pleasant it is. Could you say more about just, um, you mentioned that you've, Perhaps got like an affinity for like perhaps past life. Uh, well, one time, <clears throat> Kovilo's question is kind of interesting because I have something to say about it. Uh, it, it my own experience, when I was meditating in TM, Kagura Monastery here, I used to meditate anywhere between 8 and 12 hours a day, minimum would be 8. And... Uh, but I never had, like my friend Hung Sho in New York that has all the spiritual penetrations, and I talk to him, we talk about practice all the time, and uh, quite frequently. Uh, he, uh, he has all of these great experiences. So one day I went to Sherpa, and I said to, Sh I said to the master, I said, you know, I, I meditate all day, and the whole day goes by like nothing. You know, I stayed seven and a half years, almost never left. In a monastery, and I rarely spoke, ever, mm. and uh, and I said to the master, I said, you know, I'm so interested, but I don't know what I'm interested in because I'm not experiencing any light or deities or anything, but I'm just so interested, I can't stop. And then the master just kind of smiled and looked at me, and he said, yeah, that's that's the way it is, <laughs> you know. Mm. So. That's how it is. Everybody's experience is different. Like, for example, my friend who's, um, who's had uh, these incredibly, incredible um, experiences, uh, that would be a separate video in itself, but he's in it, and he still enters Samadhi every single day. He has all sorts of experiences, and he has all the five eyes open, you know, he can tell people's past future lives, look through walls and tell you who's coming on the outside. He used to do this in the monastery, just playfully tell us who's at outside and so forth. Um, but when it comes to practice, you know, there's no, there's no kind of, uh, you know, gauge that, that's, that's really sure, you know, that, you know, it doesn't matter, like, so, my friend has lots of experience, but when we talk Dharma together, we're just kind of like on the same level. And he'll even ask me stuff, and I ask him stuff. We go back and forth. And uh, 
you know, some people I know, you know, some Tibetans I know, it's like that too. We don't even know what we're talking about. If you say it like that, it wouldn't even seem like we're talking about it if you were listening in, but we know what we're, each other are talking about mm -hmm. and we, without, you know, being specific about anything. So the point is that, you know, meditations, a hundred thousand people can recite the same mantra, do the same meditation, but all their experiences are different, you know, but uh, I just want to hearken back to the breath because the breath is so important. If you, if you feel that you're, uh, you're, it's getting tedious. Um, I had it, I had problems, especially during my first few years of meditating all day, uh, of it becoming tedious. And uh, it was a time when I had my room just opposite the master's room. And so I would, Anytime I got tired or fatigued or find myself getting into a torpor and it's not really interesting like I like it became at Tantagata Monastery, I would stand up and I would meditate for an hour or two hours standing in place and shake it that way. So there's something to be said about vigor. And uh, uh, if, you, if, if you find that you're not going anywhere, and to this day, if I ever find my mind not alert when I'm meditating, I do something else. I mean, I'll, first I'll stand up. Even today I stand up. I'll meditate standing. If after a half hour standing I'm still spinning my wheels and I'm not getting going anywhere, I know the meditation is not right, I quit. I, I transfer the merit, bow six times, and go out and mow a lawn or something. You know, just change the energy. So. Uh, if there's a point here, it would be that never fight with yourself. Mm. You know, n never go about against the flow, but find a middle way. Try and get through whatever it is. If you can't, after really trying, then go do something else completely. Mm. That's a great. That's a great point. I mean, just a variation of practice. When I've had those periods of just being put in almost like a pressure cooker situation where. You're given advice to just do sitting meditation or just focus on the breath and not really given an avenue for other ways to practice. That's when it can get tedious and, and even even painful. But like as you're saying, you know, knowing yourself well enough to know when you can shift positions or do something else around the monastery. And especially in a way place like this, there's so many different avenues for, for practice. I mean, there's ceremonies going on pretty much all day. As you say, you can go out and do some work. You could just stand up and... I'm curious um, just more about this faculty of interests. So for yourself, um, it just conditions are such that you've been able to kind of aim this interest faculty, whether it was the mantra, be still and know, which is presumably an inter taking interest in the knowing, mm -hmm. just being the knowing, or an interest in the m different mantras. Be still and know I am God is that turning on the I am consciousness. So it's another way of saying, who am I? Which is a classic self-inquiry oh, wow. practice. Uh, that would be a different topic, but uh, self-inquiry, which is a dialogue with oneself, and you'll find mm -hmm. the whole half of the first half of the Shrangama is, is basically about that, but people don't seem to realize it that read that book. But it's basically learning how to have a dialogue with yourself, no matter how ridiculous you might sound to yourself, asking who am I until somehow the gears mesh and you can keep a dialogue going for an hour or two hours. That's the most powerful form of meditation. It, it beats mantras or anything else, visualizations. and The self-inquiry is the most difficult and it's the best kind of practice. Who am I? Who is me? Mindful of the Buddha. It's not a mantra, you don't recite it over and over again. You start a dialogue with yourself and you boil inside. Mm. But uh, uh, while I'm thinking of it and ties in with Tovilo's question, one of the things that uh, the master told me many times is never use force. You know, never force yourself to practice. You know, never, never, you know, uh, and, and, and in fact, in any kind of action, mowing the lawn or fixing a bicycle or anything, never use force. Sure, like I used to love to clean, you know, 
And so he sometimes Circle would see me doing something that looked like I was working here. He said, don't use force, you know, figure a way to do things easy. So in, 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 one of the great things about living with the Master Xuan Hua was, is, is he was a great meditation teacher for seated meditation, but he was even better at just being, teaching people how to do simple things. Like if you're, if you're, like it says in the Shantideva Bodhisattva Charya Vatara, if you're moving furniture around and it sounds noisy, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't be making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And like even, even now, if I uh, engage in cleaning or something, which I really love to do as a pastime, um, it teaches mindfulness and a lot of things about physics and stuff like that. You can, you can find, get interested. The master was really great at showing us how to really absorb the mind in ordinary affairs like dishwashing and things like that, cleaning the altar, anything, turning it into a meditation topic itself. And so for myself personally, I learned as much about meditation from the things that Shurku would do and come up and talk to me about, like real practical things like, you know, uh, cleaning dishes or cleaning the toilets or something. And he showed me a way of doing it I didn't think about and stuff. And or sometimes he would, he'd just say something that you figured out later what he meant. But the, the master was really very good at making us aware deep in our heart that meditation is not about sitting. It's mm -hmm. not about any posture. It's about being present. Mm -hmm. the present. You're always present inside, you know. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, you're 100% there. It, med, sitting on a meditation cushion, it's, the, being present is not limited there. It's not mm -hmm. limited to being on a meditation cushion. Mm -hmm. Could you share any thoughts or any advice? I mean, you've lived in these different forms, in different schools of Buddhism even, and in different outer outer garments. And um, I'm curious if you can tie that in or maybe give advice to anyone who's looking for an external form that works for them, which maximizes this type of presence or how what you would suggest for someone who's trying to figure that out for themselves. Because that's what you've been doing. I mean, you are basically finding what works, it seems like, to maximize this variable of, of presence, maybe? Yeah, well, being present, uh, the best thing I can say about uh, how to learn to be present is to get in the presence of somebody that's really present. Mm. There's nothing like being in enlightened presence. You know, mm. I had the thirst for that before I met anybody, but I knew it was there. And I knew that without getting in the presence of somebody that was really present, I wouldn't get the, the, the impetus I needed to learn how to be present myself. The most important thing Shurfu taught me was that I can become enlightened, just like him. You know, I have no doubt about it, you know, and I wouldn't, I would have a doubt about it if I hadn't met uh, Master Xuan Hua, if, if I hadn't had that opportunity, if I hadn't met Tushik Rinpoche and some, a couple of Satya Sai Baba, if I hadn't been in the presence of somebody that was really realized, there's just something in the small difference that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to know what I'm talking about, uh, I interviewed Hong Xiao in New York, who was very close to who I talked about with all the spiritual penetration, I interviewed him for a two-hour interview. I went to New York to interview him, and it's on my YouTube channel. It's some, it says, Long Island Hong Show. Uh, if you go there, uh, there's a 10-minute, the whole video is pretty good because it's just talking about him being with the master for two, you know, uh, for uh, two hours and just talking about him as presence of the master. But one of the interesting things he told me was uh, he said like one time he was sitting with Shurfu and um, the master started cutting his fingernails mm -hmm. and it w went on for 
a long time and he's cutting his fingernails while he's talking to, to his disciple, Fred, who's talking to me. And uh, you, he says he, he never seen anything like that. He never seen anybody cut his nails with mm. that kind of a mindfulness and mm. presence and just meticulous and doing it so with so much absorption in what he was doing, like he wasn't distracted or thinking of anything else but his fingernails. And he describes that in the video and kind of like it, it speaks to what I'm saying about it. So just you watch that because it's coming from somebody that really got more out of Scherfer, uh, Master Schwenoir than almost anyone I know, maybe more than anyone I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's something about that presence, even if they're sitting down or walking, you, know, you see Saki Sai Baba walk, you know, it's like, uh, like, like the Buddha says, you should walk like the wind, isn't that right? Or uh, what? It's got a different thing where he's got one where you should walk like the moon. There's walk one like where the you stand like a pine, sit like a bell. Walk like the breeze. Yeah, walk like a breeze. Well, you know, you know, like you see somebody doing, in this case, I'm talking about Saki Sai Baba. When he just walked, there was something that was completely surrealistic about it. It was just unbelievable. It was like some angel or ephemeral being moving around. And uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to say about seeing is believing, you know, so like for me, I believed a lot, but like, I never until I met Master Shuen uh, Law, I never believed that enlightenment was always something outside for me, you know, that I, I, I thought I could learn about it, you know, and really get close, but I never thought I could really become enlightened. And now I, I, I don't think there's a possibility that I won't, you know, and it's all because of seeing it in somebody. You have to see somebody that's realized, be in their presence. Then, then it's easier. It's a shortcut. And, you know, like they say, when the guru, when the student is ready, the guru appears. So it's for everybody. And to get in their presence, you know, I'm not suggesting everybody goes looking around. Uh, but I... My, my way was I meditated all day until the conditions were right, then I found somebody. I didn't go looking for them, it just happened, you know, like the, the practice demands it. So uh, what to do about getting in the presence of a master is to do your own practice, and then it'll all come into place, it'll all happen. That's great advice, and you're a great living example of that. Um, there's a sutta in the Pali Canon called the Badali Sutta, where the Buddha praises even just seeing enlightened beings or seeing people who have right view is great. Why is that great? Because then you can hear them. And why is hearing them great? Because then you can actually give your heart to their teachings. And when you listen to their teachings, you memorize the teachings, you've seen them, then you can actually put the teachings into practice. And that's where, um, yeah, that's what, that's what the Buddhist life is all about. Uh, Richard has written a number of books. Maybe the most closest to recent is this Master and the Masters. Yeah. Uh, about his time with Master Hua, uh, Shifu. And, I mean, you've told me a bit about um, some of your, when you were in Nepal, basically, with your family. You would take your whole family on a motorbike and just go and visit great teachers every yeah. weekend. And yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's impressive. That, um, that quality, that interest, that zeal in wanting to meet enlightened masters. That's what a great, yeah, I think a lot of people, maybe especially Americans, don't, don't see value in that or just don't know how to approach it, so um, appreciate that. Yeah, that's very important what Tobulo said. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when I was, you know, starting out, it was a lot more difficult. I had to go to India and Nepal. Whoever came to America, with very few exceptions, Muktananda, uh, Yogananda, um, uh, were a couple of exceptions, but there was a lot of frauds coming over in the late 60s, mid 60s. But nowadays, there are great teachers that are touring America. Uh, it, it travels a lot easier and are phenomenal teachers that are teaching. And they teach on a regular basis in different places. So pay attention, sign up for different Dharma centers that you know are authentic that you know are true and uh, 
the master is a, a, a great master, enlightened master from a long time lineage. Investigate the different places and teachers and get on their newsletters. And uh, there is still a lot of baloney around, you know, false teachers. And, uh, you know, look in the background. Sure signs of something amiss is any kind of uh, exorbitant prices for going to a teaching. Number one, it should all be whatever the charge is, it should be voluntary. And, uh, you know, of course, the conduct of the teacher, which is very easy to find out nowadays. But there's a lot of really fine teachers that are touring, giving three or four day teachings here and there, reading transmissions, uh, initiations of various sorts. And uh, find them. You don't have to become a disciple, but at least go and listen and see the teaching and, and uh, hear the teaching and uh, practice it. Mm. That's your book. Thank you. Maybe we can <laughs> close right there. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, all right. Well, <laughs> there you have it, everybody. And uh, I'll put some links in the show notes. But um, thank you very much, Richard. And You're welcome. Maybe, it's my I think pleasure. We'll have, I think we'll have lunch again tomorrow. So, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs>